When I was watching all of this, like I have this bent towards liberty that I assumed everyone else had, and this yeah. was a very, it was an important thing for me to to lose that naivety. Like liberty is something you have to want, and you have yeah. to want it at number one. And one of the things I found that I didn't think of before is you can use someone else's desire to do good for others to convince them to give up their liberty. Yeah. And that is the way that I felt sure. about the you're not doing the mask for you, you're doing the mask for everyone else. And so that yeah. way if I am not complying with the mask ideal, then I'm somehow selfish. And I thought that this was an interesting trick of logic that uh that is that may all, that may simultaneously be true. That is correct. Yeah. You are doing it for other people, but then also has like really serious ramifications for for liberty. Yeah. It really does. And it, it, it was interesting. I'm having my bathroom redone. So I have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of workers in our house. And I was talking to one of them the other day and he's like, you know, I, I don't believe in masks and I'm not going to get vaccinated. And, you know, what I said to him is, is, is I also believe this, but I was also trying to speak his language. And I said, why don't you want to get vaccinated? He goes, well, I just don't trust the government. I just don't trust any of it. And, you know, I, I just am worried about the long-term uh, uh, effects of the vaccine. I said, well, really, why I would like you to get vaccinated is because I would like the government out of my life. I don't want them to tell me I can't go to restaurants or bars or I have to wear masks. And I don't want to be told I can't go to the Cayman Islands and go scuba diving, which I love to do. And they won't, you know, they won't let Americans in or only a limited handful. So I said, if you would get vaccinated and then all your friends would get vaccinated and we get to, you know, 90 percent vaccinated vaccinations in the U.S., we don't have to worry about any of this anymore. And he was like, yeah, that's really interesting. And I think I probably didn't convince him. <laughs> it's an interesting concept, like the trust of government or really the trust of anyone. Like I um, am naive in my level of trust. Like, and I have to watch myself with that because when the mask thing first came out and they were saying, don't wear masks, my wife is an eternal uh, preparer for everything. Yeah. So we had hundreds of masks oh, here. Nice. And so uh, they were like, they're no good to you. You should give them to us. Yeah. So we did. Oh, wow. And then when they did the about face on the masks being like, no, now everyone is required. That's when I was like, I'm out. Like, yeah. wh like th this, uh, if you can have a noble lie, you know, I think that's kind of uh, Aristotle's concept. Noble lies get real dangerous real fast because once the government becomes convinced that their lies are noble, then you have a challenge that, who should you trust? Should you yeah. trust the, the government that believes they know a truth better than your independent uh, yeah. thoughts on things? For sure. And I, and I think it's fascinating to look at different cultures and how they've reacted to the pandemic. So, for instance, Asian cultures, as we all know, you know they, they, were, they quickly and easily universally adopted mask wearing when COVID hit. In fact, I think a lot of them were wearing masks before uh, a COVID hit. And if you, you look at it, yes, in America, we have this sense of individualism and liberty. And that's so important. And in some of these other cultures, they actually put the, the health and benefit of others first. So they're more of a communal sort of thinking. Like you, you think about your society first and your individual second. And a fascinating study looked at, well, why is that the case? And they've looked over the history. And for various reasons, a lot of these Asian countries and cultures have had a lot more in terms of epidemics and pandemics. So they've learned to work together to fight disease where here in the West, and maybe we're you know, not packed in as much together, we haven't had that. So we haven't had the practice. And if you think about it, you know, the, they, had, they had the first SARS, they've had you know, more of the, the, the MERS, things like that have occurred over in these other cultures, and they were fully prepared. And for us, it was this test drive. And of course, we split politically. Which, which was unfortunate. So it's, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, there is something to be said for how density changes a culture. And for the United States, we had for 200 years almost infinite growth potential. There was yeah. just so much space that, that people could just keep going, keep going west. And then eventually you have to start building up. And once you start piling a certain number of people on top of each other, the way that things are in a lot of Asian cultures – your culture has yeah. to change because you can't have the individualistic uh, mentality. Um, and so then you have to have somebody that comes in and mediates how are all these relationships going to work. Right, exactly. And, and I think it was Frederick Jackson Turner, who was a historian, and back in the 
I think late 19th century, he came up with his frontier thesis of America, that what made Americans exceptional was that we always had a frontier. And that that, that was just part of our ethos and our uh, uh, culture. And he had these concerns that once the entire United States was settled, that if we no longer had a frontier, we would lose something what it meant to be essentially American. And I think we could see a bit of it pop up again in the 60s with you know, Kennedy and his moonshot, right? So that was the next frontier, kind of to steal from Star Trek there a little bit. And then you look around now that what, what is our frontier? And maybe we don't have one. Well, and then if you don't, then what happens to those traits that people used to be valued for bravery, for standing for liberty, for uh, trying things in the face of, of danger. Yeah. All of those people that we've had a high selection pressure for, that we want those people to raise up in the hierarchy, now all of a sudden don't have a place. Right. And now they're being told, no, all these traits, they're not only not needed anymore, they're considered toxic. We want them yeah. out of here. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, uh, that's so true. And one of, the, one of these other uh, people that was working in my bathroom, he, he had something very interesting to say when we got into to all this. He said, he said, John, I think the issue with America right now is it used to be that we all thought we were heading towards the same destination, but we just had different ways of getting there. Because I think the two sides now think that each other's trying to take the country in an entirely different direction. And obviously there's other, been other points in our history with, with, where this is the case. I mean, obviously the Civil War. I'm sure there's been other times. But I think that that's a spot-on observation. And I think that's why we... You know, look at each other with, with such, you know, skepticism and judgment is because, you know, one side is like, oh, you know, the, the other side's going to turn us all into socialists. And the other side says, oh, you know, we're all becoming, I don't know, fascists or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's just no common ground. Yeah, there's a really interesting um, social psychology student right now. He's getting a degree at Cambridge. So he, he, tech, he tweets all of the stuff he's reading about. One of the things he posted that really struck me was... Um, that the perception in the U.S. is that the other side, if you're on the right, then the left, the left, the right, that uh, you perceive that they dislike you more than you dislike them. Yeah. And at first I was like, no, that's not true. I know that the other side dislikes me more than I dislike them. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wait a second. Yeah. No, that's probably true because yeah. I don't actually – deeply dislike people that are on, um, you know, a moderate left, you know, like I also really don't particularly like people that are on an extreme right. Yeah. Right. Sure. So it makes yeah. sense to me when I sit back and think about it, that it's, it's in someone else's interest, but not the yeah. regular people to have this sense of polarity yeah. is to believe that other people hate me more than. Well, well, none of us get outside of our bubbles. And, um, I, I just recently, well, you know, I, I actually turned 51 tomorrow. Oh, all yeah, right. Yeah, Happy yeah, birthday. Yeah, thanks. But so when you're 50, you age out of YPO. And YPO is Young President's Organization. And uh, so you have to be a president or CEO of a, of a firm of a certain size. And there's all these events. But one of the amazing things is you have these forums. So there was nine of us in a forum. And we meet at least once a month. And you share all sorts of things, you know, issues about your, your kids and your business and health and, you know, your, your hopes and your fears. It's really amazing to, to get to know these, these people. And... In my forum, almost everybody was of a different political persuasion than me. And it was so good for all of us because I highly respect every single one of these other eight people. And we really care for each other. And I learned so much from them about why they have the views they do. And they learned a lot from me. And, you know, I was like the, the token, you know, I don't consider myself a liberal, but to them I was a liberal, <laughs> right? And it was just amazing for me to get outside of my social bubble and to deal with other people. And I, I truly believe that some high percentage of Americans, 70, 80 percent of Americans agree on most things and uh, that we do want common things. And there may be some different ways of getting there. But it's really on the extremes that, that you know, again, this, this worker in my, my bathroom the other day, you know, I, I think that's the impression that, you know, the people on the right think the left just, you know, they want us to be a socialist or maybe even communist country. And if you actually sit down and talk to most people that are, you know, like you said, center left, that's not what they want at all. Well, I think, you know, you really hit it on the head about um, the future, right? Like, if you don't have a vision for where is it that we can go? then there's no, there's no way to build together. You know, my wife and I often right. find that whenever we hit a point where we're like not in sync, 
It's because we don't have an aligned vision for yeah. where are we going to be in a month? Where are we trying to get to in a year or in a few years? And so that's when we get back to yeah. first principles. Right. But it seems really difficult right now to even say, how would you have a conversation with a group of people about where we want to be. Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures. <laughs>